morning, brothers. It's a great joy. We see your faces. Uh, we prayed uh, extended sessions uh, for this gathering, uh, for your attendance with us, for your safekeeping and God's provision for you. And uh, it's with great joy uh, that we gather and see your faces and hear your voices and sing together, pray together. Uh, Brother Jason Hutchcraft is not with us right now this morning. He was going to open the meeting uh, with prayer. He became ill at our home last night and, and had a difficult night and, and uh, was feeling a little better this morning. Vertigo, uh, something overcame him. So we want to remember him that he's supposed to preach this afternoon. And he was barely able to stand last evening. It just came on him very suddenly. And so uh, uh, we prayed for him last night and this morning. And, and uh, before we begin this morning, I, I especially want to pray for him and his uh, preparation. He's uh, preparing to come and meet with us now. Father, we entrust our good brother to your watching care and provision. The enemy has made this attack. And uh, he was not able to sit or stand last evening. And, but you provided for him through the night. Uh, he rested well and was more stable this morning. So we ask for your provision that he will shortly arrive to be with us and be able to stand here in this place and proclaim your word as he prepared and as he wants to, Amen. Uh, having traveled so such a great distance to be with us. Again, we rejoice in the proclamation of this good truth, the eyes to see and the ears to hear of these good and precious things that you have done. They are our hope. They are our anchor. They are our strength. They fill our hearts and minds with things that cannot be seen and things that cannot be shaken. And in them we joy and rejoice with thanksgiving. We lay these, this need before you and we pray in Jesus our Savior with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. The prophet Daniel, our brother Daniel, spoke these things. They were shown to him. These were things that were shown to our brother while he was there. And Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, were dominating the world scene, politics, economics, uh, military, all of these things, they were dominating. No man, no man could stand before Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this was a heavenly decree, you see. God provided this. God put him in that place. Nebuchadnezzar learned that lesson, didn't he? In the classroom there for seven periods until he learned that lesson. And then he uh, wrote his term paper, had his term paper published and distributed across the empire about who was really managing things, who really was the governor of all things, even though, even though these things had been given into Nebuchadnezzar's hand for a short time, just a short time. And he learned that while this young man, Daniel, uh, taken there as a young man, we don't know how old he was, how long he'd been in the king's court when he was shown these things for sure. Or, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So he was not a, a, a young man at this point. He had much experience in the uh, uh, management of government affairs where he'd been granted. And uh, Belshazzar being Nebuchadnezzar's uh, grandson, technically his grandson, called his son, but technically his grandson. And I saw in my visions a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. He wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Now we're going to focus on the main facts this morning, the emphasis of these things. Four great beasts came out of the sea, each different from the other. Lion, eagle's wings, the second a bear raised up on one side, three ribs in his mouth, Another like a leopard, on its back four wings of a bird, four heads. And after this, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, huge iron teeth, devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet, different from all the beasts that were before, had ten horns. In this one horn, there were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. And then the scene changes dramatically. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. 
His garment was white as snow, his hair of his head like pure wool, his throne a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A streaming, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and thou, a thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, the books were opened. Now we know where all of these things came from, don't we? From this throne. From this government. That's where these other things came from. The other powers were just animals. You know, like, like living machines. That they, they did what they were programmed to do. We talk about animal instinct and so forth. Well, that's like a living program. That it's, they're designed to accomplish and do certain things by the one who programs them. This is the one who's doing the designing. This is the systems manager, if you will. Okay. And he's seated on the throne, and it is a it is a staggering spectacle. Just his presence. He hasn't spoken yet in this scene. Just his presence is overpowering from a human perspective. There are no men there. No men. Need no colors and pomp of human courts, no ordinary guards with spears or swords standing at the doors. No, none dare approach him without his permission. He's the one. All authority and power emanates from him. And as it goes out from him, he manages it and watches over it, and it accomplishes whatever he sends it for in whomever he puts it. All these things. The court was seated and the books were open. All things are known. See. All things are managed. All authority. All power. I watched then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain. Its body destroyed, given to the burning flame. Well, it's just gone now, this terrible beast. It's just, it just appeared on the scene, did a few things, and then it was gone, just like that. Something that would horrify and terrify men. That they would think nothing, nothing could, could destroy the power or manage the power of this beast. Why, this beast just does as he pleases. Nothing can stand against him. He's gone now. Well, he's gone now. Ink on pages. Pages of paper, huh? The powers and authorities of men that are granted to them. Great nations, vast powers that rolled across other nations, other governments, other armies, economies, so societies, uh, just swallowed them whole, enveloped them, dominated them, controlled them. Oh, they're gone now. They're gone now. I'll read a few things about them, mention them once in a while. Do a little study about them, you know, think we learn something about uh, human nature and, and, the, and, the, and the course of human events by examining historical things like this. Think we learn something, you know. Its body destroyed, given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, by the way, remember the rest of the beasts. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Well, they're gone too, aren't they? Ink on pages, paper pages, maybe a few carvings in stone here and there uh, that you have to put a lot of effort into uh, to deciphering. And if, if you can at all, if you can at all, just dust on the scales. Huh. The wind blows it away. Now, Certain ones who build their careers on these kinds of things speak about them uh, with great pompous words. But we know they were here and they were gone. The men who had those powers, they just appeared for a little while. Well, their lives were just a vapor. Appeared for a little while and are gone. But the Ancient of Days, nobody speaks about any kings or politicians that way, the ancient of days, and wouldn't dare speak that way about them. Well, that would be foolhardy, wouldn't it? To speak that way about a man, 
who occupied an office or a throne or a palace somewhere, ancient of days. <laughs> well, their palaces are not even ancient of days, are they? They've fallen down. We go over there and take pictures of the piles of rubble. People walk through the piles of rubble. There are great pillars fallen on their sides and broken into, how many pieces is that anyway? It's broken into, you know? They try to put them back together and stand them up again and get some idea of what's going on, and they're all falling down. And none can put them together again. Huh. These thrones and powers of the earth, of course, their bodies are from dust to dust. Yeah. For the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. We still have some earthly authorities that we have to deal with from time to time, don't we? They fight among themselves. One rises, one falls. I remember when I was a boy in the fourth grade, our fourth grade teacher sitting at her desk, weeping and shaking about the Soviet Union. Oh, my. Oh, what are we going to do? Nikita Khrushchev sitting there in the hall of the United Nations with his shoe pounding on the desk in front of him. Just, he just made the world shake. Oh, my goodness. The media was terrified. I remember I was eight, uh, nine years old when that happened. Saw that on television. I just made the whole, just practically made the television shake to see things like that. Well, where is this guy now? His own people did him in, didn't they? His own people. And they did their government in, too. See? And it goes round and round, you know, as Solomon describes it. Just round and round, up and down, over and over again, the course of human events, but not the Ancient of Days. Amen. He sits above the circle of the earth, its inhabitants like grasshoppers. Flying at the next breeze, the next stiff wind, stirs them up. The birds capture and carry them away. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, look, behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom Amen. that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting Amen. dominion. Amen. Son of man. Son of man. Now, these former potentates and powers were that, that uh, title was not even granted to them, was it? Son of man. No. That title is used only by the Ancient of Days. Now, he does use it in kind about one other, doesn't he? Our brother Ezekiel. In fact, he's called that uh, 93 times in his record. He's called Son of Man, our brother Ezekiel. Who, by the way, was out in the countryside preaching at the same time Daniel was seeing these things in the city, wasn't he? He was out among the people in the refugee camps. And he was declaring the things that were shown to him. And it was an extensive record compared to Daniel's. Why, it was uh, almost four times larger than Daniel's record. And he saw some like things, some like things, but the Lord called him son of man in order to get us acclimated to this term. The Lord revealed these things to Ezekiel as a representative of the people of Israel, son of man. Go tell your people. Tell your people this. Remind your people of that. On and on and on. Things that broke Ezekiel's heart about his people, about his own circumstance when the desire of his eyes was taken from him. Don't weep, son of man. Don't weep. For I'm about to take the desire of their eyes from them. And it was only days before word came. Jerusalem has fallen. The temple is gone.
but this one. Unlike the Son of Man, he came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, brethren, when we think about kingdoms and dominions and authorities, there's a couple of statements of scripture that we want to keep in our minds. It's already been uh, stated to us, delivered to us in kind in this primary text here, verses 13 and 14 of Daniel 7. Two places in the Psalms, though, it says, Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Amen. To him, then to him, were given dominion and glory and the kingdom. Now that's the son of man. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. It was given him. It was given him from another place. This one who was the ancient of days who sat upon the fiery throne with countless attendants before him. That's the source. He's the one who grants dominion and glory and the kingdom. He's the one who directs all peoples, nations, and languages to serve him. As part of his dominion, since it's everlasting, God gives it to whomever he pleases. Why, that was part of Nebuchadnezzar's term paper, wasn't it? That statement. He gives it to whomever he pleases, doesn't he? Yeah, pagan king who had all authority and power across the realm. No one questioned what why Nebuchadnezzar could put someone to death. He could raise someone to the seat of power. And he did, didn't he? And then it was decided that it would be taken from him. In the midst of his glory and his dominion, it was just taken. But, of course, it was held for him because this was God. He was in the classroom for a while. And God was doing these things, and so it was held open for him until the time when he was restored. What a, what a stunning thing to think about, even on a human level. You know, when, when one ruler falls, another one takes his place, doesn't it? Not in this case, he didn't. His spot was held open. Because God was doing a work. A work that no man could do. A work that no government can do. No council could do. No human authorities could do. The Ancient of Days did. Among the nations and the peoples of the earth. In the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, though he was a son, he learned obedience for the things which he suffered. Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. See, these statements, of course, are connected to this son of man. This is the exposition of the identity of this one who had been granted to us, who walked among us, who carried this title, son of man, who used it about himself repeatedly. Matthew records it 32 times. Mark records it 14 times. Luke records it 26 times. John records it 12 times. Uh, Hebrews and Acts uses it one time, and Revelation uses it twice. This phrase about the Son of Man. The Son of Man. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. Seen by the Apostle the beloved apostle who walked with him, who ate and drank with him, who saw him laid in the tomb and was one of the first to see him rise again 
and saw him ascend then to glory. To him was given glory, dominion, and a kingdom. The Son of Man, the Son of Man, to him was given glory, dominion, and a kingdom. The nations are as a drop in a bucket. They're counted as small dust on the scales. He lifts up the isle as a very little thing, Lebanon. No, Lebanon is nothing. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them out like a tent, brings princes to nothing. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. Amen. This is the way he's described. See, he's the one who gives these things to this one whom he sent into the earth, whose glory we have seen. The glory as of the one and only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And of, his, of the fullness of his grace, we are all partakers. Nations, their governments, these things were granted to him, and so nations and their governments serve God's righteousness and God's glory. And the most high divided the inheritance to the nations. He separated the sons of Adam. He set the boundaries of the peoples. This is what he did, see, according to the children of Israel, those whom he had appointed. He's managing, overseeing all of this. He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. The general, we remember the general reaction, don't we? Why do the nations rage? The people's plot a vain thing. What, what, what will anyone do against him? Who will rise up against him? Who will question what are you doing? None do. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed. Remember how the room was shaken when this text was cited there in the prayer of the brethren in Acts 4? The room was shaken. They were given boldness when they remembered, Oh Lord, you've made the heavens and the earth. These rulers that gathered together against your anointed, they did what you decided would be done. Now it looked like evil men had overpowered the master. That's what it looked like for a few moments on the outside. But now they saw, now they saw, they, they were doing what your hand determined, Father. Now show yourself strong in us. Make us bold. And he did. See? It's true. It's, it's, it's very likely that the council was meeting at the same time the brethren were praying. They were probably meeting, deciding what their course of action would be to deal with these men who had been with Jesus. Who had not been in their schools. They had been with Jesus. And it sure looked like maybe they were going to make a little more trouble. So we've got to be prepared. We've got to be prepared. <laughs> but, of course, it did them, did them no good, didn't it? None whatsoever. You, as a Peter said, you decide whether it's right in the sight of God for us to obey you or God. You decide. If they'd have had their way, they'd have killed him right then when he said that. But they didn't have their way, did they? No. See, the Son of Man, the Son of Man was managing, was administering his Father's will in these things. And he needs not the appearance of robes and armor and worldly thrones. He's able to manage the hearts and minds of men. Especially for good, he's able to manage those who are yielded to him. But even those who are not. Why, well, he can make them say what he wants them to say. Don't you know that it's better for one man to die than the whole nation perish? See? Tell them, bring forth your case, the Lord says. Yes. Let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There's no other God beside me. They all serve his purpose. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. 
He is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he was proven. In the scroll of the book, it was written of him. Behold, I come. I delight to do your will. O oh my God, your law is in my heart. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He proved himself. He proved himself in the earth, made like his brethren in all things, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, for that in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted is faithful to him who appointed him. We have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Amen. He learned obedience by all the things he suffered. Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. The Ancient of Days executed this plan to set his anointed on his throne. The prophet spoke about this beforehand. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The Lord has said, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. The nations are your inheritance. The ends of the earth, your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron. You'll dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise, or be instructed, you judges of the earth. Be wise, O kings. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one. That's what he did when he came here to the earth. With your glory and your majesty, with your ma and in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. This is how he worked. While he was in the earth, didn't he, brethren? The people fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. He demonstrated this while he was in the earth. In all his words, in all his deeds, in all his testing, in all of his administration of what happened while he was here. We spoke about this uh, last Lord's Day, that the, uh, the enemies of our master had decided not to arrest him that Passover. No, we're not going to arrest him. There'll be trouble if we arrest him. But it was the time, and they arrested him, didn't they? After he sent the appointed one to deliver him to them. And they came then to arrest him, and he had to manage the soldiers, the armed soldiers. He had to manage them. Get up now. I told you, I'm he. If I'm the one you're looking for, take me and let them go. See, he managed all of this. He managed all of this. He only spoke or he only responded to his inquisitors, to his judges, when it was appropriate for him to speak. If what they asked, if what they looked for and probed for had nothing to do with what was really happening, he didn't even speak. And that was a great insult to them, wasn't it? You speak to us when we speak to you. Well, he didn't. He chose what to respond to. He directed their thing, and he pared it right down to the basic reality, didn't he? Are you the son of the blessed one? That was the whole point, see. And God made sure it was spoken. He made sure it was said so that the testimony could be made firm and sure. I am, he said. I wonder if any of those men thought of this text. When Jesus said, you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. He said that in their presence there, didn't he? Before those chosen few of the council, he said that. That harkens right back to this primary text this morning. About this one like a Son of Man being brought on the clouds to the Ancient of Days. How all these things fit together. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. In the midst of your enemies. See, this is where we still dwell. 
And we have testimonies, countless testimonies, down through the generations of brethren who served and were governed and were directed, who gave themselves in the midst of their enemies. As the Savior administered the will and purpose and word of God in them, they yielded their bodies to no other but to him. Now look like, it looked like, Brother John Wycliffe, Brother John Huss, countless others, it looked like their enemies took their bodies and did as they pleased with them, didn't it? No. They yielded themselves to God. Only to God. Brother John Tyndall, only to God. They would yield to no other. They would not give up the truth. They sold everything else in order that they might have that pearl. And they had it. They kept it and would not let go. They would not let go. He ruled in the midst of his enemies. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He raises them up. He takes them down. Puts them in place. Uses them to do the few things that he intends for them to be done, and then they're gone. Then they're gone. His chosen ones, his appointed witnesses, gave this testimony, beginning with Peter's words, speaking about King David being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ. That his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up. He gave this testimony that God spoke it beforehand, and he has brought it to pass then. In his second sermon, those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. God has spoken to the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Yes, all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. These are words of Peter's sermon there in Acts chapter 3. To you first God raised up his servant Jesus and sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from your iniquities. So all of these things God has managed and worked in his anointed one who was sent to the earth, who walked the earth, who fulfilled these things, who yielded himself in all things to his Father and became the source of eternal salvation for us. Amen. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him from every corner of the earth, abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. All nations you, whom you have made shall come and worship before you. He said, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. Too small a thing just for Israel. I'll give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. The Gentiles shall seek him, the prophet Isaiah said. No barriers of geography or ethnicity or earthly origin. Cornelius' household, the gospel preached to the Gentiles at Antioch and extended from there to every nation, James said, God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name with the words of the prophets, with, and with this the words of the prophets agree. And he cited the text there, uh, Brother uh, Hosea or Amos spoke those words then that James cited. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul wrote there in Romans chapter 10. His authority was asserted over every aspect of the human experience. Now, he demonstrated this while he was here in the flesh, didn't he? Nothing was too hard for him. Whatever sickness, whatever disease, whatever spiritual uh, dominion or domination was brought before him, he just dispatched them Amen. with a word, with a touch. He didn't have to be there, did he? The centurion, the royal official, Go home, your servant is well. Go home, your son is well. To the Phoenician woman, go home, your, the, the demon is cast out of your daughter. See, it didn't matter. It just didn't matter. He could assert his authority, his authority in any manner 
in any way, in any shape that he pleased because he was the source of it. There was no system, there was no methodology to it that made it magical. Well, the sons of Sceva found that out, didn't they? Yeah. These are not just magical powers. You say the right formula of words, not so. Not so. It has to be something you know, doesn't it? Jesus, I know. Paul, I've heard about. Who are you? The demon said. Before he sent them away after a good thrashing. Even his enemies said, look, the world has gone after him. And that was when he was entering into the time of his weakest here on the earth, wasn't it? That was when they were going to take control of him. And he was going to yield himself to that. But the world had gone after him. That's how it looked. Just a couple of days before. See? But God bore witness with both signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. He directed them in all things to accomplish God's will. His dominion is everlasting and will not pass away, shall not be destroyed. It is complete in its effect. The number quickly grew from 3,000 to 5,000 till they stopped counting. They stopped counting. The word of God spread. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. A great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed there in Corinth. Many in, at, in Ephesus came, <clears throat> pardon me, came confessing and telling their deeds. Many who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. 50,000 pieces of silver. Dominion, see. And the effect of that rule complete in the lives, right down to the wills of the people. I gladly remove these things from my presence. I commit them to the fire never to be used again. You know, they didn't have any rummage sales, did they, to recover their, to recover their investments? No, they didn't. They gave it up to the fire. It couldn't, those things couldn't be used again. They, wouldn't, they would never dominate anyone again. Prematurely. Committed to the fire, huh? As all things shall be committed to the fire. The disciples, the way it worked in them, I've already mentioned about they were uneducated, untrained men. Untrained as far as they're concerned. They were trained on another level in another realm, weren't they? Yes. They realized they'd been with Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, I was formerly a blasphemer, persecuted, and insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Of the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul wrote that in every place your faith toward God has gone out. We need not say anything. They themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned from God to, from, from idols to God to serve the living and true God. And he said of the Colossians, where Paul had not been, by the way, his students from the Bible college there in Ephesus had gone there to preach in Colossae, and they had a great uh, conversion of believers. And he said, this word, this, the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. And so while, and not only that, while he's doing all of these things, every opposition falls before him. Yeah. Amen. Jesus cast out the demons. None of them attacked him. When he touched a leper, no leprosy affected his body, did it? No. His enemies... Absolute and total frustration, even with his followers, much more so with him. There was nothing they could do. There was nothing they could do to him until the time was right. You remember John records two times they sent soldiers to arrest him. Two times John records the crowd 
The, the ungodly ones in the crowd took up stones to stone him. And he was gone. That one time, of course, in Nazareth, they would throw him off the cliff, but he walked right through the midst of them. See? All of these things he managed, and he vanquished other powers. Some rulers believed. Called for Paul and Barnabas to preach to him. And they got a strong demonstration, didn't they, at the false prophet Barjesus? I just wonder if maybe he was making some kind of claim about being connected to Jesus in some way, you know. But he was shown to be a liar. He was shown to be a false teacher. The powers of darkness released their prisoners from the young girl in Philippi to many, many others as he extended himself through his people. As they yielded their hearts and souls and minds and bodies to him. He, yield, they, he, he worked through them things that were staggering. The Apostle Paul taking control of a ship of 280 some people when he very possibly was wearing chains himself. He took control of the whole thing. Stood up, calmed their hearts and minds, told them what was going to happen, and it all turned out just as he said, didn't it? After he was able to give testimony that he had confidence that it would turn out just as he'd been told, and it did. I have to wonder the effect on the soldier Julius, don't you? Luke doesn't tell us little tidbits like that, but you just have to wonder. They shall be safe in their land, the prophet Ezekiel said. They shall know that I am the Lord. When I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them, they shall no longer be a prey for nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell safely. No one shall make them afraid. Now, brethren, we know that down through the generations and even some places today, believers are somewhat afraid sometimes when enemies come against them, but not really within themselves. Not really. They're concerned about their safety. Certainly they are. Those that they're close to, the other believers around them, their family members, they're concerned about that. They certainly are. But they repeatedly yield themselves to the Son of Man, who has all authority and dominion and glory. They yield themselves to him again and again. Even in this generation, they do that. And we have done that on another level. All around us this day, all around this area, people have given themselves over to every other thing. But we have willingly and gladly gathered in his name to hear, to speak about these things, to exalt him, to raise these things up so that we could hear them again. They can do their work in us powerfully do their work in us so that we can be emboldened to speak the word of God as we ought and as we want by the way Zechariah John the Baptist's father said these words we should that we should be on the birth of his son that we should be saved from our enemies from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant that we, being delivered from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And the prophet Isaiah said, Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. And the prophet Zephaniah responds, The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. Do not fear, Zion. Let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God's grace and peace to you, brethren.